Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler and a very warm welcome to the channel. What I have in store for you today is jaw dropping. I am talking about one game coming from the 2017 Singfield. But before I draw your attention to this game, I am a bit concerned about how many viewers perceive this channel. It is fine to like or dislike a particular video, but it would be even nicer if I just had a bit more info, particularly when it comes to those who dislike any video. If you're one of these viewers, can I please ask you to let me know what feature or what is it you don't like so that I can make the necessary changes where needed. Okay, once we got this out of the way, I want to look at probably what is believed by many to have been the shocker game of round four. In fact, we have two shocker games and if time permits, I will look at them both, but not in a single session. What I want to look at today is the game between Carlsen and Maxime Vachier-Legraf. Maxime himself is one tough opponent and up this game in recent times. But how does he fare against the world champ? Let's have a look. In the 40 times they met, we saw 11 draws, with Maxime only being able to win, I think, six times. But surprisingly, Vajir Graf has done much better with the black pieces. I just want to take the opportunity, now that I have it, to say a word or two about the players of today and their opening choices, and how these compare to the openings of the past. In fact, if you like to make a comparison, there is hardly any. Today's players are really superheroes. They're extremely well prepared and have a vast and very diverse knowledge and execution of openings. Throw any opening challenge to them and they will know how to deal with it. And in this game, we did see some strange situation before the game got off. Carlson White went for what is arguably the most diverse opening, Knight F3, because there are so many opening transformations or transpositions, if you like. Maxime opened up with Knight F6, and now with C4 and C5, we had the symmetrical variation of the English. After Knight C3, Maxime went for the most aggressive of moves, and he won D5 forcing the exchange and with e3 Maxim got rid of the knights and as a result the queens came off as well. With the king recapturing Carlsen lost his castling privileges but this is not something he didn't know. Bishop f5 drove the knight back to d2 with the idea to push this e-pawn ahead. Knight c6 did lead to e4 and now with the bishop finding a new spot on g6 Carlsen pinned the knight on c6. Rook c8 was a defensive move, and this move does not really need to be explained. If the bishop captures on c6, the rook can recapture, and black does not need to land himself with a double pawn. It is as simple as that. Carlsen came up with h4, going right after the bishop, and by stopping the pawn from advancing, the rook came in on e1, covering the e-pawn, so that the knight on d2 can be relocated. After e6, a4, bishop e7, g3, castles, and now a5, Maxime got his rook in on d8. The game is wide open and many pieces are scattered all over the board. Maxime's bishop on g6 is pretty strong. His other bishop is fine, the two rooks are in full control, and particularly this rook here on d8 who keeps a tight lid on the freedom of this knight on d2. Carlsen pushed on with a6 and Vashir Le Graf closed up the position to avoid any complications. Carlsen's problem right now rests with the position of his king because it paralyzes the knight and the only way to free up the knight is to just move the king out of the way. He therefore went for c2 and now with knight finding e5, Carlsen attacked the knight. Vashir Le Graf got his knight on g4, and this knight here is pretty much enjoying an extremely rich and powerful position. 
OK, he has no clear targets, but he's momentarily untouchable. Carlson simply must have overlooked something, but nevertheless made a rather weird move. Any ideas on what he went for? He got his king out to b3. Was he getting himself into trouble? Well, I think there is one way to find out. f6 led to the knight coming into c4, but what was the aim of this move? Getting the knight onto this square leaves him pretty tight because he has nowhere to go unless Carlsen aims to intercept the black knight on g4. Maxim didn't even give Carlsen a chance to find out because he went for this move, knight f2. After e5 saving the pawn, Maxim repositioned his knight on a far better outpost and what a game this has turned out to be. Bishop e3 led to bishop f5 and just look how strategic this move is. Maxime wanted to grab the pawn on g3, but this is not possible because of a most definite rook g1 move. In this light, before being able to take on g3, Maxime got the bishop out to f5, leaving Carlsen with one response, rook to g1. After rook d5, rook e1, king to f7, bishop back to c1, and I hope you can see why these moves are made. Maxime retreated the bishop to h7. And now with rook e3, rook d8, Carlsen pinned the rook on d5. Had Maxime blundered a piece or is there something in this position that goes quite deep? Just sit back and enjoy chess at his very best. We all know the rook is trapped since he has nowhere to go. But Maxime knew this. But why did he go for this move in the first place? Can you see why in 2, 1 and pause? The answer here is knight back to f2 because if Carlsen grabs the rook we will see e takes and now this knight needs to make a move. Knight back to a3 will lead to knight back to g4 forcing the rook all the way back to e1 and now with the bishop coming into d3 Carlsen has a problem. Rook d1 will drop another pawn on a6 and though black is a rook down, he has plenty of compensation. His pieces are far better positioned on the board and his chances of winning the game are far greater. After knight f2, the rook returned to e2 to attack the knight and with knight now to d3, there was plenty going on. We know if the rook on d5 is removed, we will reach a similar position as before and for this reason, Carlsen was reluctant to capture him. He first went on and took on f6, and now with the recapture, Carlsen withdrew his bishop, and now through rook g8, bishop d2, and again, getting the rook back to d8. The game followed on with bishop e3, bishop e4, rook d2, rook back to g8, and now Carlsen made a runner with his king to a4. When was it ever we saw Carlsen get his king on a4 with this or a similar position on the board? Maxim knew he had a solid position, not necessarily a winning one, but he was in no rush to come up with anything and his rook move back to d8 speaks volumes. Once Carlsen got the king back to where he came from, we knew this game was not going anywhere. After rook back to g8, king a2 and now f5, Carlsen did not seem to have anything going on. Rook h2 and now rook back to c8. This was now becoming to be the most boring of games. Rook d2 and again rook g8. Rook e2 and now bishop f3. Carlsen got to h2 and now through bishop f6 the game was beginning to move. It was very slow but it was at least moving. Here we saw knight d2, bishop g4, rook f1. Rook d8, knight c4, e5, takes, takes, and now with bishop g5, Maxime found the chance to remove this pawn on g3. Carlsen's rook move is in fact a blunder, but he knew what he was doing. After pinning the rooks, the rook grabbed the bishop on g3, and Carlsen gave up his own rook on f1. Carlsen could easily have grabbed the rook on d8, but he didn't. He rather went for rook f3 and now with bishop e2, Carlsen could have gone for this lovely variation. Rook takes knight, rook takes rook, and if you now remove the rook on d8, 
the recapture will lead to a check on d6, but swapping the pieces by removing the knight and now the bishop, this position leaves us with one result, and it's not difficult to see who wins. Maxime himself confessed he did not have any idea who was better when this position was reached. Having gone for the rook on d8 meant one thing. Even if Carlsen was better off, he was no more, because after removing the rook from f3, once the bishop took away yet another pawn, the recapture led to a nice and typical Carlsen variation. Bishop to c6 pinned the rook. Maxime found the best move here and went for bishop e4. And you know how resourceful Carlsen is even when he has nothing left on the board. Any ideas on what he came up in 2, 1 and pause? a7, what a move, forcing the rook all the way back to the 8th rank. After knight d6 check, this game was on fire. Maxime took the knight and Carlsen in turn was just one move short of queening. He could queen, but what good this would be if the rook captures the bishop. A queen against a knight, a bishop and rook will be no contest for white and particularly when black has more pawns on the board. Carlsen knew this variation was not going to work and removed the bishop first. This very move pushed the rook all the way back to d8 and now Carlsen got a brand new queen on the board. But was this enough to snatch the game? Only time will tell. Once the rook came off for the queen, the game went on to become a very fiercely competitive strive. Knight e5 led to king b3 and now f4. This got the king turned the other way and with king g7, king d2 and now knight g6, the pawn on h4 was guaranteed. King d3 led to knight takes, king e4 and now with f3, king e3, king f6, b4 c4, bishop e5, king f5, bishop takes and now king g4, this pawn on f3 was smelling all queen all over him. King f2 led to knight g6, bishop e6 check, king f4 and now Carlsen went for the knight on g6. Knight e5 led to the removal of the pawn and you can now see a different picture of how the knight is far stronger than any bishop. A check on d3 got the king to f1. After the most important piece squatted in on e3, this game was going to end fast. But instead of squatting the king on this square, Maxime took the other direction. And what is the difference? None. King g3 was a strong. Bishop to f7 led to the knight coming in on f2 and Carlsen was busted. Having very little to play for, Carlsen gave up. And once again, we can demonstrate by filling in the gaps, king e1 leads to knight e4, and once the c-pawn drops, this will be it. Let's assume the bishop comes in on c4, and let's assume you have the black pieces. Any takers on what you could play in 2, 1, and pause. f2 check, and now with king d1, a knight check by taking the pawn, king c2, knight d5, king b3, Black has too many choices, and I will let you finish it off in my absence. You can always get in touch if you need help. I think patience was the key to victory for Maxime, who waited and waited for the right moment to find a way and beat the strongest human on the planet. It doesn't matter how he did it in the end, but what matters is that he did do it. Both players had been very passive at times, and as a result, one had to pay the ultimate price. This great Maxime victory did not come as a surprise because it may sound funny, but the young French GM is far better off with the black pieces against Carlsen, and this game serves to prove this point. And with this result, these standings have somewhat been shuffled. Maxime Vachier-Legraf now takes the lead. Carano is right behind him with two and a half points, five players on two points and three players with one and a half points each. With this setup and pairings for round five, expect to see another super exciting contest. And on this note, many thanks for taking part and many, many, many thanks for watching.
This was your Chess Puzzler.